Well, Shem Tov says that the um, first, um, actually the second verse in Ashrei, Ashrei Yom Shekoch Halo, Ashrei Yom Shashem Alakav. How fortunate is the people that so is their lot? How fortunate are the people that God is their God? So the Baal Shem Tov explains that the word Shekacha, that so is their lot, the words that so is referring to Moshe Rabbeinu. How fortunate is the people that has a Moshe Rabbeinu? And uh, the Baal Shem Tov explains that what's unique about Moshe Rabbeinu is alluded to also by the word that so. And Moshe Rabbeinu has a clear, vivid uh, perception of Hashem in this world. And Moshe Rabbeinu's vision is something that everyone has a part of. They want a spark of Moshe Rabbeinu inside of themselves. And especially tonight when we're celebrating the birthday of Moshe Rabbeinu, so that spark of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is in us, it shines. There's more mazel of Moshe Rabbeinu in us today. So that means that this heightened consciousness of Moshe Rabbeinu, his vivid perception of truth, of, 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 of the truth of Hashem, it's something that, that's more, more accessible today. There was a, a person who was talking to the Rebbe about influencing others. And the Rebbe said to him that when you lift your head, hands above your head, you lift your hands as high as you want. The Rebbe actually, actually showed him, lifted, lifted his hands above his head. The Rebbe said, no matter how high you lift your hands up, your feet are still on the floor. But when you learn Torah, you're going somewhere higher. That's what Rebbe said. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about where, where exactly that is and how we get there and what that means. And... Um, but I want to uh, talk about, I don't think we're going to have a class next week, it's Purim. So uh, let's, let's try to uh, understand Purim a little better. Um, there's something uh, unique about Purim, different than all other holidays, and that is in Purim, we don't say halo. Every other holiday, we say halo. Hanukkah, we say halo. Pesach, we say halo. There are different kinds of halo. There's whole halo, there's half halo. And on Passover, we only say half halo. On Hanukkah, we say whole halo. And the question is, how come we don't say uh, halo on Purim? Okay. That's an interesting, interesting um, uh, response. I think that's original. You could, you could, you could uh, copyright that. So um, if you look at it objectively... There is no holiday that's more fitting to praise Hashem and to think, sing to Hashem than the holiday of Purim. In history, there was never a time the Jewish people were as threatened as in the story of Purim. Even Yamach Shemai, Hitler, he sought to annihilate all the Jews in Europe and Asia. He didn't uh, plan, at least in stage one, to go to Australia and to America and kill the Jews there. Because we were like, probably more spread out than the old Jews, you know, the more... The, the uh, system of Haman wasn't to annihilate the Jews through armies in a systematic way. Rather, he said all the, G the Gentiles, all those who hate the Jews, should annihilate the Jewish people in one day, wherever they are. Jews should, all the Jews should be killed wherever they are. So there's no place to escape. And also he said it should be in the same day. So it's not like, okay, I'll, go, I'll escape to this place and that place. I'll move to another country. There, there was never such a, a, a threat to every single Jew in the world like in the story of Purim. So if we're not saying hal, hal on Purim, then when should we? I mean, that, that's, that's the, the first um, holiday you would think we should say hal. There is a, a Gemara which gives three explanations to this question. Gemara says that there's 28 prophets, and none of the other 28 prophets caused the Jewish people to ever um, have a special time to recite the Torah. All 28 prophets, we don't have in any, we read the Torah in the synagogue, we never read any other books. We read the half Torah, but there's never like a day we just recite another book of Torah. The only book of Torah that we recite uh, uniquely as a mitzvah, according to all opinions, is the Megillah. Mm -hmm. So Gemara says, Echa? huh? Echa and other Megillah. Echa, that's a good point. So what does Gemara mean when it says, I don't do Echa? You're right. It's a very good question. I think maybe the Gemara means as a mitzvah. Echa is a custom. There's no, there's no mitzvah to say Echa. Uh, it's, not, it's not an obligation. It's a custom. Say, it's not an obligation. Could be that's the answer to your question. Yeah. But, but, but please remind me to look it up more. 
the Gemara says, um, why is it? How come the Megillah is unique? And the Gemara answers, if we say Hallel on, on uh, Pesach, because we left imprisonment and we came free, how much more so should we thank God because we left death and we got life. That's what happened on Purim. So for sure we should say something special. But Purim is a hidden miracle. Hold on, hold on. We're going to get there. So the question of wisdom where it says, so then why don't we just say Hallel? Why, saying, why do we say the Megillah? And the Gemara gives three answers. Answer number one is, you don't say Hallel, you don't sing a song for miracles that happen outside of Israel. That's answer number one of the Gemara. Answer number two, Rabbi Nachman says, the Megillah itself is the Hallel. But it happened in Israel. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well. Oh, wow. You sure you don't want to give the class? <laughs> no, you're right. If there, was, there were, if there were Jews that were living in Israel, they were also affected by the decree. That's an interesting point. I never thought about that. That's good. That's good. Now I have two things to look up. Okay. Um, the uh, Shurab Nachman says the uh, reading the Megillah itself is hollow. And the third answer of the Gemara is Rava says that. The story of the Megillah never really had a full positive ending. Yes, there was a happily ever after. We didn't get killed by the uh, by Haman, but we still were servants of Achashverosh. Achashverosh still ruled. It wasn't like the Jewish people were freed from exile and Mashiach came. There was no there's no permanent uh, emancipation of Jewish people of total freedom. They were still under the rule of Achashverosh somewhat. That's the explanations the Gemara gives, but. All these explanations leave us wanting. First of all, the first answer, because it didn't happen in Israel. So what didn't happen in Israel? If you're in yeshiva in New York, and your dad sends you uh, money from Israel to New York, you don't have to say thank you because, it happened, because you got the money outside of Israel. I mean, we only, our father in heaven only lives in Israel, and other things happen outside of Israel, it's not from him. Like, Hashem is everywhere. So what's the meaning of the first answer to the Gemara? We don't thank Hashem because we don't say hello because it happened, didn't happen in Israel. What does that mean? And question number two, uh, the, the answer number two, the Megillah itself is the hello. Okay, fine. Let's say Megillah is a nice way of thanking Hashem. Why not do the regular way? Why do this differently on Purim? And the night of the Seder, we do something unusual. We say the Haggadah. But we also say Hallel. So if we want to do something special, fine. So we'll do Megillah 2 plus Hallel. Why do we only do um, the Megillah? The Marsha, he gives this, uh, these cryptic words, that, which hopefully we'll understand at the end of tonight. Marsha says that by the story of the exodus of Egypt, God redeemed the Jewish people. The, the Talmud emphasizes, and we say in the Haggadah, Hashem saved us not through an emissary, not through an angel, but God Himself saved us. So, what does the Marsha mean by that? I mean, everything comes from Hashem. What does He mean? It wasn't through an emissary in the story of Egypt. That was a different kind of miracle. Um, by the way, uh, Nacham, I expect you to ask a question. What about the story of Passover, where it didn't happen in Israel either? And we do say hello. Same name. <laughs> so, the answer is the Gemara says, that you only, um, this rule only happened once the Jewish people came to Israel. Mm -hmm. Once Jewish people came to Israel, then there was a rule that we only say Shira for miracles that happened in Israel. Kind of like, it reminds me of, uh, the, the Jewish people were allowed to offer sacrifices in their backyards, wherever they lived, but once the temple was built in Jerusalem, so that was the unique place to thank Hashem. So in a similar way, only for miracles that happened in, in Israel, once the Jewish people came to Israel. So, oh. so, so the question is, um, why don't we say hal? There's really a couple of other questions, many, many questions about this holiday, but let's stick to three more so we could have four questions. And so we could have, we could ask why is this holiday different than all other holidays? And uh, in a similar way, we ask on Pesach four questions. So question number one is why don't we say hal? Question number two is why don't we talk about God in the Megillah? How come God isn't mentioned? The Evan Ezra says, anyone know what the Evan Ezra says? No, Ebenezer says that you don't want to mention God because this was a story that affected the royal, uh, the royalty in, 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 in Persia and therefore it was going to be recorded as well in the Royal Chronicles and they have all their old, old whole uh, slew of, of gods that they worship. So if 
our Megillah was going to be converted into a royal text, they would have substituted the name of God with some other Persian God. And therefore, we don't want to know... Huh? The same thing as Egypt. How they have the sheets and all those things. The, the, the problem was, if we would mention God's name in the Megillah, then it would have been in the royal chronicles of, oh, of Persia. Okay. They would have they would have God, they would have God's name substituted for something else. Okay, so but that that leaves us wanting a lot because the whole purpose of reading the Megillah is to thank Hashem. It's to it's to speak about the miracles of Hashem. So we're not going to thank Hashem because it might lead to someone to worship idols. So then why'd you come? So then don't do anything. I mean, it's like uh, it's 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 Yotzes Chari Sede. It's something you're you're taking away from the Jewish message because it may lead to a non-holy message. So then don't do any Jewish things because maybe someone. Is that what I'm saying? It's it. it like what's the purpose of doing anything if you're not if you're not going to thank Hashem for the miracles of of Purim? So then, uh, what? Why celebrate Purim in the first place? If you're not going to mention God's name, then then why why are you do we we celebrating it at all? Why is it a Jewish thing? Why is it a religious thing that we're cel- The whole point of this is a religious holiday. So there there is uh, some places in Megillah, especially which it's like it's so it doesn't fit. It's like it's not just it doesn't mention Hashem's name. It you could see it's like deliberate. For example. It says Mordechai cries out to God, right? It doesn't say who he cries to. It just says he cries out. He cries out with a bitter cry. Mm-hmm. There is one place in the Megillah where Mordechai tells Esther, salvation will come from another place. Mm-hmm. So some commentaries say that the word place is a word that Talmud uses for God. Yeah. But the problem with that answer is that uh, that's only something that Talmud does. The, the Tanakh and the 24 books of the Torah, we don't ever find the word makom, as a reference for God. So why isn't God mentioned? Not just he's not mentioned, but he's like, he's like deleted from the Megillah. It's, it's like, it, he, there's certain places he should be there and he's not. There is one other story in the Torah we find something similar, the story of Yosef. Although the story of Yosef was clearly something that was coming from God, Yosef had the dreams and it was clearly something that was unworldly, that was unfolding, but um, the Medrash compares the story of Yosef to the story of Mordechai and says how just like Mordechai got the ring of Achashverosh, so to um, Yosef got the ring of of uh, Paro, and just like Mordechai rode on a horse, so to Yosef rode on a horse, and other similarities, um, the, the, the Talmud says that the children of Rachel had complete miracles and complete redemption, but the question is, and they're also, in the story of Yosef, we don't find God's name mentioned throughout the whole story of Yosef, and how he gets sold by his brothers, and how he, and clearly it's a whole miraculous thing happening, God connecting one thing to the next, and yet Hashem's name isn't mentioned. That's question number two. Uh, that's question number two, right? Okay. Question number three. Question number three is why do we dress up on Purim? Why do we wear costumes on Purim? Because we're acting like Hashem who hiding. Very good. Excellent. That's just how the good it says. We, the the, the uh, purpose of dressing up on Purim is in order, since the miracle happened, Hashem hid himself, as we shall discuss in a second, so too we. Um, Dress up and put him. There is an argument among different opinions whether it is a custom, not a custom. But the Ramah himself, the Ramah who wrote the um, the the his editions, the Code of Jewish Law, he himself it says that he would walk around on the night of Purim and he would dress up like a poor person and he would go into every house and he'd say, "Oh, I need to wash my hands. I need to have my Can I come in your house and wash my hands?" And what we wanted to do was to people because they were so drunk. They would, he was afraid they might forget to have Mairev, and therefore you walk, go to house to house, and he was dressed like a poor person, and he would encourage everyone to dab. Anyway, so so uh, we see there a mud also dressed up, and the question is, what's the meaning of the dress up? And the fourth question is, Grager and Dreidel are different. The Grager you hold from the bottom. When you shake the Grager, you hold from the bottom of the Grager. When you, turn, when you spin a Dreidel, spin a Dreidel from on, from on top. Why is it the holiday of Purim? We're celebrating with this gragar that you hold on the bottom, and Hanukkah we celebrate with the dreidel you hold on top of the dreidel. What's what, what does this mean? Okay, so we asked four questions. Now we have to have the uh, second cup of wine, right? The story of uh, Chaim Chaim. It's a Jew named Rabbi Weberman, lives in Florida, a um, posik, world renowned posik, 
Uh, he and his wife visited the Rebbe when his wife was pregnant. And the doctors had told his wife that, um, that because of the position of the baby, there's no other option other than a cesarean birth. And uh, they were in the Yichidus, they told the Rebbe about this, about this uh, situation. And uh, they were asked them how they're going back to Florida. So they said, we're going to go, we're taking a plane. No, it's a few thousand miles from New York to Florida. It's not the... So the Rebbe said, but I take a plane, there's, there's wind and it shakes. I think it's better to just drive, to, to find a way to uh, drive back to Florida. So they tried to find a way to drive back to Florida, and 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 every, every time every every kind of way they tried to come back to Florida, it, they wanted to hire a driver to drive them back, and the, the car door wasn't closing properly. A bunch of different events events happened, and they couldn't they couldn't uh, get a driver, so they ended up taking a train. I'm sorry, taking a, a Greyhound, taking a Greyhound. Greyhounds are not fun, by the way. Anyways, uh, so, so they took a Greyhound. And they go in this Greyhound all the way back to Florida. And what happens in this Greyhound on the way back to Florida? There's a bunch of, you know, it's in a Greyhound, it's on a bus, and it's not so easy. And, and throughout this whole trip, what happened was the mother at one point felt the baby move. And the baby, Baruch Hashem, moved in a way that there was no longer any need for a cesarean. So there are miracles th- that... We celebrate. You know, something what happened? She had. She's supposed to have a cesarean. Not to go on a plane because of the wind and the shaking. Apparently, the Rebbe saw something else going on. Uh, apparently, the Rebbe saw something else. Rebbe conveyed it another way. I don't know exactly what that means, but yeah. but but definitely it was it, there was a point was they should um, it, they, that things should be good for them, right? And so they went. They took they took a bus and Greyhound and Peter Pan. It was, it's not so fun, but uh, it, it 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 really helped them. So the point is that this was a story. You can't point to a real, like, aha moment, like a real, like, incredible miracle moment. In fact, if you're sitting on that greyhound, you're like, oh, my gosh, why in the world? Especially they weren't from a Chabad family. It wasn't like they were used to this whole thing of Rebbes and Chassidim. They had a moon and Tzadikim, but they imagine they're sitting on that greyhound for, like, 12 hours. I don't know how many hours it is from, from New York to Florida. 16 hours. Oh. So, uh, you know, and, and, and this is a long time ago, you couldn't even, and you're pregnant, and it's, 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 so you're there are that thing for so many hours, you can't point to any moment of that, of that trip, like, oh, it's, this is such a wonderful, miraculous trip, right, it's, but, but, but it was, in a similar way, we have holidays, we celebrate overt miracles, kriyas yamsuf moments, a moment where Hashem just like, suspends the rules of nature, and the sea splits, we have holidays like Hanukkah, where we have like a few Jews, like this, let's say the size of uh, the shul in, on, on a Shabbos morning, uh, goes and decides to take on the LAPD, right? It's, it's just impossible. The story of Hanukkah to, for, for, for the, the small handful of Jews going to take on the, the entire Greek army. It doesn't make any sense. It's an obvious, overt miracle. On Purim, we're celebrating something which is even more impressive. On Purim, we're celebrating how nature is the main vehicle for God's expression. Imagine tomorrow you have a business meeting. You got up early in the morning and you and prepare your, your notes and you prepare your, your presentation and you go to an important meeting and you, you, you present and, uh, and it works and they accept and they buy the contract and it's fantastic. And it looks like, oh yeah, why, why did it work? Because you set up and, the, and, and that's why it all worked, right? That's why it worked, no? We, we don't realize, but the truth is that there's no such thing as nature. Nature is, is, not, is not, a, not a thing. Chacham Tzvi says the difference between nature and a miracle is that nature is a miracle that happens repeatedly. Whereas a miracle is something that happens once in a while. The difference between the word nature and the word miracle in Hebrew, nature means submerged, tava means submerged, and the word miracle means like a banner, which is raised up because even far and wide. So nature is the way Hashem hides himself. It's the main way Hashem uh, connects to us in uh, on a regular day-to-day uh, uh, level. And it's great to have a holiday where we're celebrating Hashem showing Himself, but there's something more incredible about Purim. Hashem, when Purim were shown, that all these little things that happen that it seems like they're just happening by themselves, they're really Hashem is orchestrating everything. The, the, the Megillah doesn't have a, a unique moment. 
I mean, if you think about the Megillah, you realize it's impossible for these things to happen. There's four years of a search to find the most beautiful girl to marry Achashverosh, and where do they find her? Find her in, in a house of some rabbi in Nebrak. You know, it's it, 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 it's just this story is an incredible story. And then Achashverosh wants to kill the Jewish people with Haman, and the night that Haman comes to Achashverosh, that exact night, his, he remembers how Mordechai saved his life. This 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 whole story. It's clear that Abishur is, is doing everything, but it's only clear when you look at everything together. You look at each event by itself, it's, you can understand it, you can explain it. It's, it's hidden in nature. So that's, as you said before, that's why the custom of Purim is to dress up, because in Purim, Hashem, so to speak, does the same. Hello. The story of Pesach is different. The story of Pesach is, as I mentioned before, the Marsha says, Hashem doesn't, doesn't go through any intermediaries. Hashem himself shows himself in, in Mitzrayim. Hashem shows himself in a clear, overt way. You could see Hashem is making it happen. What's unique about Purim is Hashem is hiding himself. Hashem is hiding himself in the king and in the queen, in Achashverosh and in Haman. And in all those different garments, Hashem is expressing himself. This little boy, he uh, sends a uh, letter t- to the White House and he says, Dear God, I would like to have a gift of $100. Mm-hmm. So he figures, you know, send to the White House, probably that's, they'll, 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 they'll relay it over mm-hmm. to. But uh, President Trump looks at the letter, ah, what a nice thing. He sends back, here's $10, love God. And the boy writes a letter back, Dear God, I really appreciate the $100. It's such a pity you sent it through Washington. Those, those got none of him. So they stole ninety percent of it. So, um, so, so. The, the, but the point is, the boy said it correctly. It went through Washington. It doesn't come from Washington, as you mentioned before. This how the Gaon Rebbe says. That's why we dress up on Purim because God dresses up on Purim, and that's why. That's what the Gemara means when it says you don't sell, say how on Purim. Why? Because a miracle that happened outside of Israel. Ben Gurion said, "What the words mean?" He said a very poetic words. He said, "In Israel." To be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. You can't you can't explain Israel without talking about miracles. I mean, just to, to just today, <laughs> there's the third election, the second election, there's the first election. You could, could see there's no other country in the world that has this. You ever heard of a country that has three elections in the same year? It, 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 we, you could see that there's, there's something going on in this country that that's different. It's just different. Um, I remember the, the the first Gulf War when the, when the 39 scuds hit Israel. And uh, you're looking at it, and, and, and you're like, wow, another scud. This, this buildings are coming down, thousands of buildings coming coming down, and, and, and people are okay. How could that be? And uh, you get used to it. Uh, on the last day of the war, a scud hit an American base, and unfortunately, 28 soldiers were killed. So uh, someone gave the following parable to explain this. This king uh, punished his son, and he told his son he has to get 40 lashes. He's lashes him 39 times very softly. And the 40th time, he gives him a big patch. Says, what do you do that for, Dad? I want to show you what I saved you from. So uh, the truth is that, that, that the story of the first Gulf War and, and the continuous story of Israel, it's, it's, a, it's a place where, as it says in the Torah, it's a land where God, God's eyes are upon the land from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. It's a place where divine providence is more obvious. So this, what's unique, though, about the story of Purim is, yes, so, so there are miracles like, like which are Israel-like miracles, which don't go through intermediary. And those are the miracles that you naturally sing for because it naturally inspires you. But then there are miracles which go through the garments of nature, like the story of Purim, which it doesn't naturally make you want to sing. That's why the first opinion of the Gemara is, the story of Purim, you can't sing for that story because that story went through the garments of nature. Only a story that happens in Israel, which spiritually means only a story which happens without any garments, that's a story that makes you rock, get up and sing. But a story that goes through all the different garments of nature... Doesn't, doesn't make you want to sing. That's the first answer to Gemara. Second answer to Gemara is the Megillah itself is the hollow. When you look at Torah, you look at the truth of Torah, you read the whole thing together, that, that's where you could see the miracle. You're looking at it with, with our regular glasses of nature and regular glasses which are used to seeing everything in a, in a regular, down to earth, rational way, you talk, I don't want to sing. If you look at the way the Torah speaks about it, the way that we look at it in this whole story of Purim, then you get a sense, you start to feel the, the truth of Hashem that's expressed in Megillah. That's why the word Megillah, as Esther means, what's Megillah means revelation. Esther means concealment. 
Megillus <laughs> Esther tells us that place Hashem um, most often is in the place of the darkness. That's where you find the revelation of Hashem. That's what the power of the, of the message of Purim is. It's specifically a place where Hashem's name is not mentioned, where Hashem expresses himself. And that's the idea, and that basically answers all, all of our questions. No? Oh, the Gragar, very good, very good, very good. So, why the Gragar? It's the same idea. There are miracles, like the story of Hanukkah, where Hashem just, so to speak, reveals himself from heaven, comes from on high, and shows himself to us. That's one kind of miracle. There's another miracle which comes from within the world itself. It comes within the garments of nature. That's the story of Hanukkah. That's why the story of Purim. That's why you hold, you hold the Gragar from below. The idea of holding the Gragar from below is that you see Hashem's hand in nature, in the here and now, in the way, in the way the world is. Not that Hashem is just showing himself in a revealed way above everything. And this is something that is very connected to tonight. First of all, as I mentioned, the whole miracle of Purim and the whole reason why the whole holiday, the whole month is considered a month of joy. Usually, you know, you wish someone good yantif. And this month you're supposed to, I guess the correct greeting would be happy Adar, happy because the whole month is a Freilich HaChedesh. They've actually said that the happiest day of the month of Adar is the last day of Adar, because every day of Adar is supposed to increase more and more joy. So where does it all come from? It all comes from tonight, the seventh of Adar, Moshe Rabbeinu's birthday. That's what brings the Mazel of Adar. That's what brings the time of divine grace and mercy. So what we're getting from this whole discussion is that by connecting to Moshe Rabbeinu, by studying Torah, you go somewhere. The more you study Torah, the more you put your mind into the wisdom of Hashem in the Torah, the more you, you get, get a perspective of Asher Ham Shekachalo, how fortunate the people, Shekacha, Shekacha is miracle equivalent to Moshe, that has a Moshe Rabbeinu. But not just they have someone named Moshe Rabbeinu, not just that there is a Rebbe, the Tzad in every generation, but the Rebbe gives us that insight into the world by learning the teachings of the Rebbe, learning the teachings of the Torah. You get that perspective yourself. I mean, uh, it's, it's just one last point, just to bring, bring this home a little bit. Uh, the Rebbe started a campaign to light to for everyone to um, check their mezuzahs, and it used to, people weren't so careful before they began this campaign. Very religious people weren't careful about that every door should have mezuzah. I know very very religious people that they had a house and they had some mezuzahs, but not every door. But the Rebbe brought this consciousness to Jewish people that. There's an issue. The first thing that everyone naturally thinks of, oh, mezuzah. Uh, I have to check the mezuzahs. Why, why is it our go-to place? How, how do we even have that? that how, why is that our first thought? Why, where did that come from? It comes because that's, that's the, the, the uh, Ashem Shekachalo. That's the, the way the Rebbe gives us a Muna by giving us this insight in, into our lives that there's a mezuzah and there's tefillah and there's Hebrew Torah. It, it's real. And by learning more Torah and learning more chassidus, we get this perspective, and it brings a personal geula. And the uh, main things we should have the real geula from the Shiat Zakenim, and we'll see this this truth yeah. in a down to earth way. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim.